Okay, so to continue, transcendentalism is, one way to think about it is, I know it's a paradox to say this, but it's almost like a secularized religion. Um, it's, it's even more than a philosophy. It's a way of thinking and doing and being and belief that is not, again, centered on like the supremacy per se of a, of a higher power or God. It's much more human centered. And again, like the, it's, they called, called it the human potential movement. Uh, they believed that religion and, and transcendentalist philosophy needed no outward display. It was all about, it, it's actually the, like, it's like the opposite of transcendentalist philosophy to be so, like, who's a better transcendentalist? Oh, I don't know. Look at him. Like, it's, it's not, they were really fed up with uh, the fakeness and phoniness of all the outward display that they saw in terms of people's beliefs and actions versus how they actually lived their lives. So um, they were pretty opposed to materialism. Uh, again we've had the industrial revolution at this point and so things had become a, there's just kind of this um ma like move toward mass production mass consumption um that material goods were the most important thing you know it's the same a lot of the same stuff that we deal with today in terms of like oh okay like so let's use cell phones for an example now granted they become a necessity but it'd be it would be very interesting to know what thoreau and emerson think about cell phone use and cell phone culture and this I this almost like the conformity of like well if you don't have one then you're you're completely out of luck you know so we all kind of have to conform and it's but it's just um yeah just kind of obsessions with material objects which they were very much opposed to they believe that that got in the way of what's really important in life so they their sources of values and inspiration were not taken from the past in the form of religious scripture, but this idea of going out in the present moment and having encounters with nature and with yourself, as in like going out and like getting to know yourself again in solitude. They were big fans of solitude and listening and looking for what they would call your inner light but they believed you had to get away from other people to be able to do that. And that you, yeah, shouldn't be influenced by religious scripture. So you can probably tell that they didn't completely come up with this. It's sort of a, a hodgepodge of different influences, very eclectic, very cosmopolitan, meaning like lots of different ethnic and national influences. So there were already transcendentalists in Germany. So they took for, from them. Um, also, Platonic and Neoplatonic ideals and philosophies, a lot borrowed from Indian and Chinese religions, and also a, so you don't hear much about this guy anymore, but there was a guy named Swedenborg, and so he he actually had like a cult, almost, of followers, and they believed in something called Swedenborgism. He was considered a prophet. And, uh, like almost like a swami and he said that each person must actively cooperate in repentance reformation and regeneration of one's life so kind of that ties in really nicely with that revivalist thinking of you have to it's, it cannot be a passive thing like each person you me everybody needs to actively cooperate like it says in repenting for the things we've done wrong and reforming the things about ourselves that need reforming and improving and then in the process regenerating your life over and over again all the time that there's at no point are you like done as a person so again this the human potential idea human growth very american this idea of like that you can change yourself that you can be whoever you want to be if you want to change versus being born into a certain fate or destiny. So again, this idea of reform and making changes, like self-help in a way, this was both almost like a religious and social kind of reform. Uh, I've got a little fridge magnet quote up here in the corner. What lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters compared to what lies within us. So that's one of the Emerson fridge magnet quotes mentioned. So in terms of religious reform, 
a lot of the religious ideas of transcendentalism evolve from the Unitarian belief, which if you're familiar with Unitarianism, it still exists this day. There's a Unitarian church in Greenville, at least one that I know of. So Unitarians are a lot, they're, they're all about, like it says, exercising of the intellect and free conscience and this idea that each individual needs to be encouraged in his quest for divine meaning. So very, like the opposite of that there's like one right way to be a, a follower of Jesus or God, that there's like, that there are many, many paths to the same goal and that each person needs to be allowed to kind of explore their own paths and, and rather than like, you know, it's it's either hell or it's you know <laughs> very dogmatic kind of looking at things. So very kind of free and open, but it evolved from that. But they felt the transcendentalists felt that it was lacking in a lot of ways, and they felt that it was a little like a little weak. Like they wanted something much more intense in a spiritual experience. It just everything felt very tepid to them with Unitarianism. Like it's it just wasn't doing it for them. So. Which, I mean, that's understandable. It's definitely a kind of go-with-the-flow kind of thing. And, um, yeah, it just wasn't enough of an experience for them. And for that reason, actually, they, which is ironic considering Unitarianism is trying to encourage the exercise of intellect and free conscience, they were actually criticized, the transcendentalists were criticized as heretical by the Unitarian Church, which is, again, pretty ironic. Uh, this is actually a quote. I know it's really long. I'm kind of breaking the rules of PowerPoint. But this is a quote from uh, a Harvard professor at, during the time of the Transcendentalists about the Transcendentalists. It's from a paper that he wrote called A Discourse on the Latest Form of Infidelity, which I, I love that phrase. Um, and, in, and this was meant to be a criticism of unit, uh, sorry, of Transcendentalism, but if it actually really encapsulates the philosophy well, and it actually makes it quite appealing. But um, so he said, the religion of which they speak, therefore, exists merely, if it exists at all, in undefined and unintelligible feelings, having reference perhaps to certain imaginations, the result of impressions communicated in childhood or, the, or produced by the visible sign of religious belief existing around us or awakened by the beauty and magnificent spectacles which nature presents. So yeah, again, this, that was meant to be like a takedown, like, like he's trying to drag the transcendentalists and in doing so just gives this really kind of spectacular definition of, of who they were and what they're about. So I thought that was kind of neat. So they did, they're, even though they were labeled as heretical, they did continue to think of themselves as Christian. And they did try to articulate their philosophies within a Christian theological framework, which, I mean, it does work. You know, there's a lot of different ways to be a Christian. And, of course, the people they're speaking to, uh, which, again, there's lots of denominations at the time. So there's, there's a, a, I guess, an opening. There's a toehold for something like this to happen. But they, but they knew that they had to explain themselves and their ideas within a Christian theological framework because that's what they're – their readers and their audience would be the most familiar with and understand. So this makes sense. Um, though some, like Emerson himself, he completely rejected all established forms of religion. He felt that they that the worst thing that ever happened to basically Christianity was Christianity. Like the the, the religion has done nothing but like the formal organized religion he felt was like the exact opposite of what we should be going after that all that we need we don't need someone else to tell us what's right or wrong we don't need someone else to tell us how to interpret scripture we don't need someone else to do that like the, everything we need is within us it's actually pretty quaker in a lot of ways of course they're they're organized too they get together and don't say anything together but emerson was like no even that's too much. Like you need to go out by yourself and get get in touch with yourself again, and that can't happen with people chattering in your ear and telling you what's right and wrong. So, our guy Emerson, uh, he was, as you probably picked up, the principal spokesman of the transcendentalist movement. He was really kind of a cultural middleman through whom the the different. European aesthetic and philosophical currents passed on to Americans. So he was, yeah, like a kind of a cultural 
representative in a lot of ways, bringing all kinds of interesting aesthetic and philosophical ideas to America. So they already existed. He just kind of brought it all. And he was a, kind of a spoke, like a, he was the, the head guy. He gave direction to the movement. It, again, it's religious, it's philosophical, it's ethical. And above all, it's this idea that each person has spiritual potential. Like that is at the core of everything they believe. Another little quote from Emerson, always do what you are afraid to do because that's where all the good stuff happens, right? So he was actually the son of a Unitarian clergyman. And he inherited that job, and which, like I said, had attracted all his ancestors in direct line from Puritan days. So he actually had a lot, a lot in common with the Brahmin guys, but he was like the rebel renegade one. He went rogue. Um, why? Well, there was a bunch of untimely deaths in his life, and his educational experience really led him to question the Christian doctrines that he had been raised with. He was really dis dissatisfied with just relying on the quote-unquote evidence of miracles given by the Bible. Um, he was like, nah, if I didn't see it with my, it's very Thomas Paine, right? Well, if I didn't see it with my own eyes, like, that's, sorry, I'm not just going to take your word for it kind of thing and oops, sorry I need to move this down a little he wanted he, he was tired of hearing about it you know that's all it was for him it was like all right everybody keeps talk talk talking at me I want my own revelation I want to have a direct and immediate experience of God and I believe that's that's a heretical statement in a lot of ways but that's at the core of everything that he believes and he believes everyone has that potential he also believed in a concept called the oversoul, and the oversoul is kind of mm, tricky to explain, but he believed that our spiritual renewal comes from our, we all have basically like our, we all have a portion of what he would call the divine oversoul, and that to, we have to get in touch with that, that our intimate personal experience with your own portion of the oversoul is like how you will have that religious experience. And he believed everyone has the potential to do it. So it's almost like the analogy sometimes I use is like, if you imagine that the universe is a giant bucket and we are all holes and like everything around us and ourselves, we're all holes in the bucket. So we can see in like, we can see into the bucket and we can see all the other holes but it's only when we turn around and look at our through ourselves that we see everything that's outside of the bucket right and that's where like the big picture happens ah that's probably not a good example but that's how i think of it but to do that you have to look inward right you have to you have to turn your gaze from out to in so he believed that the oversoul is present in and permeates the entire creation and all living things. So it's like the light that comes through the holes in the bucket. But you, you can see other lights, but you can't see your own unless you turn around. So yeah, he said it was only accessible if a person takes time and has the courage to look inward, not outward. Mm -hmm. So it's true. And like this is something he said, it takes time to do. It takes patience. It takes like that all the world around us is really good at distracting us from doing this. And that it's, it can be really terrifying to truly look inside and see the truth of yourself and everything around you. So he believed that what we would call understanding is how we comprehend the material world outside of us through so, through our senses and our reasons. So seeing the other holes in the bucket, basically, like looking, looking, we're in that bucket, you know, we look through our hole to the, all the other holes and things we see around us. That is what he would call the understanding. And I've actually got a vis video in the corresponding videos folder that's a TED talk about the difference, between, like philosophical and physical difference between um, mind and body that is really cool and I highly recommend you watch it, I hope you do. And he would say that when we turn around and look 
like outside the bucket, so to speak, that that is what he would call reason. It's our intuitive awareness of, that's like an eternal truth that, oh gosh, I hope this bucket thing's making sense. <laughs> that's what's happening outside and that's immutable.